Happy Sunday, church family. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in worship today. We love gathering together with you as we live out our mission to worship Jesus, love one another, and serve the world. Now, before we get started, let's check out some of the amazing things Jesus is doing here at Cyprus.
got this hope. We've got a future. We've got the power of the resurrection living within. We've got this hope. We've got a promise that we are held up and protected in the palm of His hand. And even when our hearts are breaking. Um, my name is Tim. I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at Cyprus. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Whether you're in person or online, we want to um, welcome you. Our mission as a church is to worship Jesus, to love one another, and serve our world. As we begin our service today, we're going to pray together. Uh, but before we do, I want to share with you a few next steps that are going to help you strengthen your relationship with God and others here at Cyprus. Firstly, hands up if you are male. If you are of the male species, this is just for you, sorry ladies, um, we are inviting you to join Pastor Ben and our Elder Chairman Paul Cripe for a special men's retreat at Mount Hermon from Friday, October 8th to Sunday, October 10th. So if you have any friends as well, hopefully you do, um, we're inviting you as well to invite your friends. We recommend that you actually register in a group of three. Um, and for more information about that, you, as always, you can go to cypresschurch.org or actually to sign up, you can go to mountherman.org. Secondly, very exciting, season three of our sermon-based small groups begins next Sunday, September 19th. Um, <coughs> Cypress small groups are a great way to see your life enriched by community, to help you connect with your church family, um, and a great way to enjoy fellowship together. So we want to invite you to that as well. To sign up, you can get, or for more information about that, again, you can go to cypresschurch.org or visit the uh, lovely Welcome Center in the lobby as well. Let's pray together. Father, we want to come before you once again. Lord, we're so thankful for this morning. But Lord, also our hearts are heavy with the reminder that this is the 20-year anniversary of 9-11. Father, we know we live in a world now where sometimes, Lord, evil men do evil things. And Lord, this morning our hearts go out to the victims of 9-11 still to this day who must still carry the burden, still be grieving those um, that were taken on that morning. But Father, we thank you as well that there is hope in Jesus Christ. Lord, even evil men cannot 
thwart your works. Lord, even the works of darkness cannot bring down your church and, Lord, those that call on your name. So we just pray this morning, Lord, that at this time, Father, there'd be, there'd be great healing for those families. But also, Lord, for us as a nation, that we once again turn our eyes to the one, Lord, that not only can save our lives, but save our souls. So, Father, we thank you for that this morning. And as we turn our attention once again to you, Father, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would continue to grow us in your likeness, and that you would continue, Lord, for our love for one another to grow and abound more and more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, would you stand as we worship together this morning? serve a great God this morning. Let's worship. And when I think that God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my birth and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I will bow in humble adoration and there
There are so many reasons to bless the Lord. As he's blessed you this morning, let's bless him with our worship. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like this. We know our hope is in you alone this morning. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love. 
gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Amen, church. Please have a seat. As you're doing that, would you put your hands together? Just say thank you to our wonderful worship team here leading us this morning. It's good to have people to lead you in worship. Amen. The other thing you may notice about this stage this morning is that we have the baptismal available this morning. Our services today include the opportunity for everyone here who has not been baptized to be baptized today. It's a special Sunday here at Cyprus. We don't do this every single Sunday, but we like to take moments in the calendar to pause and give special emphasis to the topic of baptism. In a few minutes, I'm gonna ask each of you if you would like to be baptized today. And as you're listening over the next few minutes, if you've given your life to Christ, if you have made him yours and you've committed this portion of who you are, everything of who you are to following him without condition or excuse for the rest of your life, but you haven't yet been baptized, I'm going to give you that opportunity in just a few minutes. For the next few minutes, we're going to discuss and consider the effect that baptism has on the body of believers, the church, the effect that baptism has on the church. There's no doubt that baptism has many facets, but I believe that baptism, as you'll see today, is meant to be a source of oneness within the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In this section, Paul is discussing and articulating how the body works both the physical body with its many members and limbs, hands and feet and brain and torso and the various ways that they function as one. And he says this is very much like 
the church. And he says something that I think is particularly applicable for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, he says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, as we worship you this morning, we seek that you would help us to understand the incredibly important role that I believe baptism plays in the life of the church. Lord, you've given us baptism as one of the specific things that we are called to do as believers, both individually as we follow you and as a church, to practice over and over and over as a church. So Lord, would you help us understand today how it is that baptism ultimately brings us together as we celebrate new life in the church. And Lord, would you bring us together as one body, though very different as individuals. Would you bring us together as one body, seeking your glory, and we'll give you all that glory. In your name we pray these things, amen. This weekend, the entirety of the United States, all 330 odd million people who call this land home were united. As we remember the events of September 11, 2001, 20 years ago, we reflect on and remember an event that at its core was meant to tear us apart. But as you can likely attest, in the days and weeks and months that followed, we were not, as a nation, torn apart, but we were united together. It seemed as you drove down the streets of your neighborhood that nearly every house had an American flag outside. People showed a level of kindness and appreciation for one another that simply didn't seem to exist prior. For a time, churches were brimming at the, at the peak, filled to capacity. We felt something that many of us had never really experienced to that level before, unity. We look back and we remember what that was like to be unified. And I emphasize was like, because even on the 20th anniversary, when we remember the events of that day, when we remember those who lost their lives, we do so as a country deeply divided. Many experts suggest that we've never seen or never been more divided. National polls taken over the last few years show this deep divide. Issues like politics, racism, abortion, gender and homosexuality, policing, immigration, and many, many others have polarized our nation, but also our community. We are a nation and a world divided. I was looking at one particular poll this last week, and it kind of ironically noted that there was one thing that we're all in agreement on. 80% of people agreed that we are divided. Today, Pastor Ben is guest preaching at Greater Victory Temple Church, having accepted the invitation from Pastor Ronald Britt after Pastor Britt preached here at Cyprus this summer. And this guest preaching is not simply happenstance. It's not something new or someone new for church members to listen to, to keep you interested. No, it's an intentional push led by pastors like Ben to see the church, not just this church, but the capital C, larger church, come together and see oneness like we haven't before. Because you see, if the church can't be one, if the church can't be unified, how on earth can we expect the world around us to achieve a sense of unity? And if you take stock of the church today, the capital C church, the worldwide church, the American church, you'll also see that the church is a church divided. There are literally thousands 
of different denominations, Christian denominations worldwide. That's ridiculous, <laughs> isn't it? All with different beliefs on various issues, issues in which they eventually choose to divide themselves over. There are many different issues that divide the church today and have divided the Christian church throughout the centuries. Interestingly enough, one of the most divisive issues in the church over the centuries has been baptism. Throughout the centuries, many schisms and splits have formed in otherwise unified churches and denominations regarding the role and the method of the practice of baptism. Exactly how is it supposed to be done? What are the things you're supposed to see? Who should be baptized and when? There are three general types of baptisms that are widely performed today. There's many variations of each of these. But generally speaking, you've got infant baptism, you've got a type of sprinkling, and you've got believer's immersion. There are many ways that baptisms are performed in various types of each of these three. And then there's what baptism is supposed to result in. Is baptism the thing that actually gives us our salvation? The representation of our salvation? Is it supposed to bring a tangible indwelling of the Holy Spirit right at the time? Is it manifesting the Holy Spirit? Is it an idea, a representation of the Holy Spirit? Perhaps maybe showing itself in the supernatural gifts that immediately come after your baptism? Perhaps speaking in tongues? Anybody heard that one? There are numerous ways that baptisms are performed in the various church denominations and settings. Remember, there are thousands of denominations. There are so many ways that it is done. But for a moment, I'd like us to consider how it should be done. And again, depending on who you ask, you'll get a variety of answers. At Cyprus, we seek to be a church that follows what Jesus says. We seek to be a church that reads God's word and follows what it calls us to do as best as we are able. We want to be honest. We want to be humble. We want to be genuine regarding our practice of following Jesus. At Cyprus, we believe that the Bible clearly teaches that people who, are accepted, who have accepted Christ as their Savior, who have committed to following him without condition or excuse for the rest of their lives, should be baptized by being fully immersed in water as is the norm you see in the New Testament. Now look, I don't believe there's any less power or magic if it isn't exactly done in that precise way. You likely have, as have I, seen a variety of situations where it wasn't done exactly this way, sometimes because it can't be due to the physical limitations or disability of the person being baptized. Not everyone can be safely dunked under the water. I think this is important for us to remember as we consider the differences that divide us as churches and the topic of baptism. Biblically speaking, there is likely a way that it was supposed to have been done, the way it was originally intended to be performed. However, though, though there's a physical side to everything we do in the church, we cannot forget that there is also a spiritual side, and dare I say, the more important side, the spiritual side. So we seek to perform baptism biblically, but primarily we seek to understand the spiritual significance of the actions we're performing. The foundational point of baptism is the practice by a body of believers as an act that is physical in nature, but representative of a spiritual truth. We look at Romans 6. Romans 6 says that when we are baptized, we are baptized into Christ's death. It says, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing 
so that we would be no longer enslaved to sin. So in a sense, our baptism reenacts the death and resurrection of Jesus by being plunged down into the water and raised up out of the water, just as Christ was buried and then raised up again. But there's more to it than simply being a personal action of the embodiment of Christ's death and resurrection. You see, though, baptism is very much a personal action that we each individually take after we conclude that our lives are no longer our own and we're seeking to follow Jesus. Though it's a personal action we all take as a new believer, it is an action that we take in a public setting surrounded by fellow believers. There has to be some significance to that. Contrast the setting of baptism with another action that believers are commanded to perform. Consider the idea of prayer. What are believers commanded to do regarding prayer? We are not commanded, at least primarily, to do it corporately. It is something that the Bible mentions that we should pray together. But the act of prayer is actually warned against doing in a public setting. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, do not pray like the hypocrites do in public with their hands raised so that everyone can see. They've already received their reward and it's not from heaven. But no, you should pray in quiet by yourself. Go find a closet. This is a personal thing that you do between you and God. It's not a corporate thing. Now, can we pray corporately? Of course we can. But prayer is not meant to be for the benefit of others. Yet baptism, just by its nature, you can't baptize yourself. Naturally, it is corporate in some sense, and regularly throughout the New Testament, as you see we practice here today, it is done as a group with fellow believers there to witness it and to celebrate the new life. We perform baptisms as a part of a larger gathering of believers. We perform baptisms as a celebration of the family of believers here at Cyprus because it's a celebration that someone is declaring that they belong to Jesus, that they've pledged their life to follow him. That's worth celebrating, right? Right? That's worth celebrating. So we celebrate it. Baptism is not only the solemn profession of a redeemed sinner, our appeal to God for a clear conscience, as Peter puts it. No, it's a sacred and serious act of incorporation into the visible community of faith. It's truly a shame that the topic of baptism has been one of contention over the years and has been a source of church splits and divisions. This is such a shame because the clear biblical teaching on baptism it is that it is to unify believers together. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. A few verses later, he says that there may be no division. Again, talking about the body. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. As you can see in this teaching, Paul is giving about the various ways that believers work together and serve one another within the church. He uses baptism as an illustration of one of the core things that brings believers together. Our differences in what we bring to the team should not divide us because we've been united together around the person and the cause of Christ. And that is the truth that is symbolized in our baptisms. We are not here as individuals, but as members of a body, as followers 
of Jesus. Our gifts, though all different, are then used to care for and serve the church for its betterment rather than as a source of division. There's so much in this world that can and does divide us, both in the larger world that we live in and in the church. But that, in many ways, is the beauty of the church. How God has organized it to be, it doesn't matter if we look the same, if we talk the same, if we think the same, if we agree on everything. Think about it, those are the things that matter in the world. You don't unify with people if they don't think the same as you, act the same as you, do the same things as you, it's pretty rare to gather together and be unified out in the world when those things aren't there. But in the church, what matters is not that we agree on everything or that we think the same, look the same, act the same. What matters is that the central point in each of our lives is the person of Jesus Christ. That as the apostle Peter says, Jesus is our example that we are to follow and to emulate. Paul says elsewhere in Ephesians that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism that unites us all. We're united by our faith in Jesus, by our submission to Jesus. We all individually choose to lay down our lives, our personal wants and desires, our interests and selfish ambitions, our individual ideas and beliefs. We lay all of that down as we seek to follow Jesus together, not as individuals, but as one body. And it's awesome. It's, it's, it's incredible to witness and share together But it can only be done in the power that none of us individually possess on our own. When Jesus talks about the, the fellowship of believers, the oneness that is needed amongst believers, he talks about it as we are knit together in the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I like to think a little bit more deeply on why Jesus says certain things that he says. What's, what's behind that? What was he thinking about when he says things like that? And if you think about Jesus' life, over and over and over in the Gospels, it says the phrase, in the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He heals in the power of the Holy Spirit. He resists temptation in the wilderness by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Jesus' life on earth that we have recorded in the Gospels of our New Testament say over and over and over that Jesus lived and acted in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we all as individuals who have pledged to follow Jesus seek to do so in our own power, we will fail miserably. But if we do so recognizing that none of us can do it well on our own, that we will fail over and over and over. And if instead we turn to the true source of the power that we have to live this life as we're called to do it after Jesus in his example, we will see ultimately that it is possible but only in the power of the Holy Spirit. As we seek to follow the example that Jesus has set before us, that we might walk in it we too must seek to live by the power of the Holy Spirit, both as individuals as we seek to follow Jesus daily, but also as the corporate body of believers that we call the church here at Cyprus. So it is this, this incredible mystery that is the unified church of Jesus Christ that baptism represents. This incredible mystery that is the unified church of Jesus Christ that baptism represents. And so we celebrate this incredible mystery of baptism often. We celebrate the unity of believers, the oneness of believers, to the adding of new believers to our family as we seek to follow Jesus together as one body of believers. This past May, we celebrated on Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is the day that marks 50 days following Jesus' resurrection on Easter. 
For a couple years in a row now, we've celebrated it on the lower field in a unique service. Two years ago, it was drive-in. This last year, it was drive-in and sit down. But nevertheless, a unique service that sticks in our minds. And one of the reasons it sticks in my mind, my mind, is because this past Pentecost, we had baptisms. And 16 individuals came up to be baptized that day. And a few weeks later, we had three others come up and be baptized. It's not about a huge number, but what joy does it bring to the church to see people be baptized? What a source of joy and hope and unity each of these moments of baptism were. I still, when I think about it, seeing a dad and his two sons come up to be baptized, to see a young lady say, I was driving along the road and I felt like I had to stop. And I stopped and I listened and I heard and I felt compelled to be baptized. I knew this was a step I had to take. The different stories of people, a young lady who was in our youth group who said, it's time, I've made the decision, I profess my faith in Jesus, I need to put that into practice by following him and doing what he commands. Doesn't that give you life? Doesn't that get you excited about following Jesus together? I still receive encouragement and joy every time I think about these experiences. So today we come again to celebrate the gift of baptism to our church. Baptism is a gift, a gift that we get to experience together as we celebrate the oneness that only comes through Jesus. Now in a moment, I'm gonna ask if you'd like to come down and be baptized. As service, we don't have anybody scheduled to be baptized. That's not gonna deter us from making it available from emphasizing the role that baptism plays in our church. If there's no one here today ready to make that step, that's okay. It's not a failure. This is an opportunity, a time we get to remember the things that bring us joy as believers. And one of those is seeing new members of our family take that next step. But I believe there is somebody here today couldn't shake the feeling this week that there would be at least one person here today who has given their life to Jesus, who has sought to deny themselves and follow Jesus, but has not yet taken that step of being baptized. Maybe it happened when you were a baby, you were baptized and you've lived this life and at some point you decided to follow Jesus and you hear the clear command of scripture that you were to believe and then be baptized is one of the core commands that Jesus gives us. And you want to affirm that today by being baptized. Maybe you've been seeking to learn more about who Jesus is. You've been thinking about it. You've been pondering this. You've had lots of questions. And you probably don't have all the answers yet, but you have maybe committed your life to following Jesus, even though you don't have all the answers yet. And today is that day that you want to take that next step of obedience to Jesus, because Jesus calls us to repent of our sin, of our selfishness, of thinking we know better than he does. To believe in the gospel, the good news, that he is exactly who he says he is in scripture, and to follow him. And one of the first things he calls people to do as we seek to follow him is to be baptized. So, today, right now, you have that opportunity. The water's ready. It's even warm today. We have a change of clothes for you. We've got a towel. We're all ready to go. The only thing left to be said is if you'd like to be baptized here today, please stand up and come on down. Is there anybody here who would like to be baptized? If you stand up and walk around right now, I start getting ideas, Jan. <laughs> Anybody here who would like to be baptized today? This is one of my favorite moments as the church. I've seen Ben do this half a dozen times. Oh, 
Let's pray. Father, what an honor it is to be part of your church here at Cyprus. As we seek to follow you, Jesus, we ask for the oneness that you prayed for in John 17 to be true of us here today, both at Cyprus as well as other churches in our area. Lord, we love to celebrate baptism. We love to talk about baptism. We love to figure out the intricacies of what it means to follow you boldly as your people here at Cyprus. Lord, we want the world to see that you are who you say you are. And as you say in John 17, that the world would know that you were sent from the Father because your church is one together. Lord, may that be true of us here at Cyprus. Father, knit us together as one body, teaching us to lay aside the things that could divide and uniting us through the work of your Spirit. Father, we love you, and we do all things for your glory. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Cypress Church, would you stand with us? And let's prepare to worship the Lord. And, and guess what? If you're worshiping the Lord this morning and you feel the Holy Spirit's call to come forward and be baptized, your chance isn't over. <laughs> come on down, and we'll baptize you right after the song ends. So... I just want to keep that invitation open to you all this morning. Uh, if you're feeling led by the Holy Spirit, answer that call. You will be blessed in obeying the Spirit of God. Um, there will never be a time that you regret answering the call of the Holy Spirit. Let's worship him. Sorry. 
God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. great in this place this morning. We worship you. This is your last call. Is there anyone that has decided that they'd like to be baptized this morning? Amen. We'll be praying for the second service uh, that folks answer the call of the Holy Spirit and go in the name of the Lord this morning and be blessed in the unification of uh, baptism and the unification of the believers of the church. Amen.
We've got this hope. We've got a future. We've got the power of the resurrection living within. We've got this hope. We've got a promise that we are held up and protected in the palm of His hand. And even when our hearts are breaking, even when our souls are shaking.